Welcome, everyone. Good morning. Uh, thank you for joining us for our KITP Fundamentals of Gaseous Halos program today. Um, I'm Cameron Hummels, uh, one of the co-organizers co and the moderator for this week's program. And this week, we will be focusing on the theme, what roles do non-thermal components play in defining the circumgalactic medium? As you can see, we have a different theme for each week. So pick out the ones that you're interested in and make sure to be here for them. Maybe all of them. Maybe you're excited about all of them. I, I certainly am. I will be here for all eight weeks. Um, just a few announcements as we uh, roll into our first keynote of the week. First of all, um, you probably already know this, but just to make sure everyone does, we have a full list of the program details, including detailed schedule, recordings of all of, almost all of the events. Uh, we, we leave off recordings for the speed collaboration on Mondays and for the discussion on Fridays to allow people to speak freely without, it, without concerns that their, their uh, comments will be recorded in perpetuity. Um, we just added, um, due to feedback from the community, we've added transcripts to the various talks that will be included on this as well as the KITP website, along with slides and, and, um, and recordings. And so this is really the central place that you can go to get information about the program, other than just contacting people directly on Slack. Um, something in response uh, to the surveys that we put out, we um, you know, we put out a different feedback survey every week because this is really an experiment and we're trying to get uh, improvements on how to do this, this properly and address all of the issues involved. So one of the pieces of feedback we received the last two weeks is that there aren't a lot of opportunities for junior scientists who are on the job market to gain exposure for their work and, and really sell themselves to potential employers. Uh, it's difficult within the two hour constraints of each of our day's events are already kind of jam-packed with, with activities. And because we don't have the associated conference with the program, um, this is challenging. So we've created the Halo 21 on the market Slack channel where people can submit 10 to 15 minute videos um, for junior scientists who are either on the market right now or will soon be on the job market uh, to help, you know, gain exposure for their work and, and Get their get their name out there. So um, go if you're interested, either as a as a junior scientist or you are a potential employer right now or will be soon. I encourage you to check out uh, that channel. We will be moving those videos just as we have been for the Halo 21 new results videos. Um, we will be putting those on our YouTube site, which you can look up. It's also linked in this channel. And uh, and then yeah, check out what some of the cool the cool activities and the cool research that junior scientists are doing. As I mentioned, this is feedback that we got from our survey. So also um, each week we'll have a different survey and, and yeah, please, please take two minutes and fill that out and give us feedback on what we're doing right and what we're doing wrong. And hopefully we can make this better for everyone. So today's activities, we have a keynote from uh, Dr. Peng Oh from UCSB for about an hour or so. And then we'll follow it up with a discussion for the remaining hour, um, a panel made up of both Peng as well as other experts in the field of MHD and turbulence and non-thermal processes. So Blakesley Burkhart, Chad Bustard, Irina Butsky, and Evan Scanapieco will be joining us. Um, I'll be moderating and I'll be primarily getting uh, questions and discussion topics from the Slack channel, Halo21-Week3-Non-Thermal. So um, each week we have a different channel where we try and have a lot of the discussions and comments, particularly during these keynotes, occur as opposed to within the Zoom, um, because the Zoom, essentially all the, the comments go away and there's no way to thread comments into multiple discussions, but Slack allows that to occur. So please, during the presentation, if you have a question, even just a clarification question, um, or a comment on something that Peng says, type it into Halo 21 Week 3 non-thermal uh, uh, Slack chat, and other people can respond, maybe address that question right then uh, so that, that, uh, that you can get on and, and still have clarification on what's going on. 
All right, so um, a brief introduction to Peng. Peng is a professor of theoretical astrophysics, astrophysics at UC Santa Barbara. Um, he has a huge breadth of research topics over the last 30 years, covering everything from uh, galactic dynamics to stellar feedback to turbulence to uh, cosmic rays, magnetic fields, thermal instability, hydrodynamics, the whole gamut. Uh, and not only that, but he's extremely energizing and enthusiastic, both in his presentations, as well as just like having a conversation with him. I, I always look forward to running into Pang at conferences. And uh, and yeah, hopefully you'll you'll get the same idea after after this talk. So uh, thank you for joining us, Pang. Do you want to do you want to share your screen? Sure. Thank you, Cameron. I, 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 I share the love. Uh, can you, is it, is it full screen? Can you see it? It's not full screen. It's windowed. Even now? There, now it is. Yes. Okay, great. Okay, so I don't know about the first part, but um, I will try to entertain you. So I'll try to keep, keep faith with the second part. <laughs> <laughs> so, whoops. So, okay, so non-thermal processes this week. Um, so it used to be that, you know, whenever you wanted to annoy the speaker, you could always put up your hand in an astro talk and say, what about magnetic fields? But in the CGM, we actually have three bogeymen, right? We have magnetic fields like before, and there's magnetic fields, uh, you know, without them, we, we would not be around, right? We'd get zapped by the sun. So thank goodness for them. There's also cosmic rays, and uh, there you see Victor Hess uh, going up in a balloon, discovering cosmic rays. He discovered that radioactivity increased as you went away from the Earth instead of the other way around. And then there's also the perennial pro problem of turbulence, right? This famous, unsolved, famously difficult problem. So these are, you know, the dark horsemen that we have to deal with in the CGM. So, you know, why should you care about them? So uh, I would argue on two grounds. And the first is just equal vote, right? In the ISM, um, all of these components are comparable in energy density uh, to the gas thermal pressure. And when we run our hydro simulations, pure hydro, uh, a lot of the times we are just focusing on gas when there's all this other stuff around. And uh, by the way, in the ISM, this question of why they're all equal, I've asked uh, different ISM theorists and, uh, you know, you get different answers ranging from it's trivial to that's not important to it's a coincidence. So I'm curious uh, to see what people think about that. In galaxy clusters, uh, which are another halo that we've talked about, the gas pressure actually far outweighs all of these three different components. But actually, cluster, cluster, uh, cluster ICM folks are well aware that even though they are maybe even one to 10% of the energy density there, they make a huge difference. So people there are very conscious of including these in you know, their considerations of what's going on. Uh, in the CGM, uh, our constraints are really quite poor. So um, we have to consider a very wide range of possibilities. And the other thing uh, I would argue is that it's just fun. You know, uh, there's a lot of very rich physics uh, when you consider that. And, you know, if you can't fit things with standard hydro, the chances is that one of these three things is playing a role. Okay. And, you know, our fearless leader this week, Cameron, uh, said, please make sure you appeal to the younger folks in your talk. So I thought a little bit about that, and I have some semi-philosophical rambling, which may or may not be useful. But, um, you know, there's this quote from Einstein. Uh, he says, I have little patience for scientists who take a board of wood, look for its thinnest part, and drill a great number of holes when the drilling is easy. And that's entirely my approach to research, I'm afraid. Uh, so um, I want, you, you know, I'm going to try and give some review, but I'm also going to uh, talk about some very simple-minded uh, numerical experiments, which may not seem to connect with this grand goal of understanding how galaxies form and how they work. Um, but I want to offer a, a defense of simple-mindedness. 
So, uh, you know, when I was in, in grad school, um, you know, the, one of the great things about our field is that, you know, you're surrounded by really smart, talented people. But that's also one of the dangers of our field, right? So when I was in grad school, I had what is, I, th I think we now call imposter syndrome. Although back then, we, I don't think we had a name for it. So, you know, you wake up, you feel, I don't know what's going on. Oh my God, I'm so dumb, uh, it's horrible. And uh, I'll never forget the day when, um, you know, I went to tea and there's this famous professor, Bodan Paczynski, he was, he was sitting there and he was holding court and talking about some incomprehensible thing. And then suddenly he jumped up and drew on the blackboard this diagram. Uh, and it's interesting and difficult. And he said, you guys, too many of you are living here. You're working on really hard things trying to show that you can climb up Mount Everest barefoot. And in the end, there's five people in the world who care. Um, and, uh, you know, there are other parts of this diagram. You can do easy and boring problems, but then there's no job. Uh, this is great if you are Einstein, but really where you want to be is here. And I would argue, if you listen to the things that we are talking about in this conference, you know, I'm going to talk about, okay, you take a box of gas, you stir it, and you let it cool. Or you take two fluids, and you send a sound wave through them. What happens? Right? This is not string theory here, right? We're talking about very simple-minded things. And I would argue that's actually a good sign. It's a sign of a field that you can get around. You can, you know, you can call your mom, tell her what you're doing, and she'll get it right away. Uh, and so there's a lot of low-hanging fruit. And when things start getting complicated, then, I don't know, you're, you're venturing over here. Anyway, okay, that's my cheap pop philosophy. Uh, okay, on to the science. So um, magnetic fields. So why should you care about magnetic fields? So if you're a charged particle, uh, you will experience a Lorentz force from magnetic field, and you're going to spiral around it, right? So if you're a proton that results in anisotropic momentum transport. You have anisotropic viscosity. Um, if you're an electron, you know, that's anisotropic heat transport, so anisotropic conduction. And if you're cosmic ray, you know, you're, you also have to spiral around these few lines, and that has many implication, interesting implications for cosmic ray transport. Right, so Ellen, I think on Thursday, we'll talk a lot about pressure and isotropy and things like that. But, you know, it's something always to keep in mind. The other thing about magnetic fields is that it creates MHD forces, right? So there's magnetic pressure where magnetic fields don't like to squeeze together, they resist it, and magnetic tension where field lines don't like to bend, they, they, they also resist that. Now, in terms of how magnetic fields grow, you know, that's a whole other complicated can of worms. Uh, Ellen is an expert in that, um, but in, in terms of, you know, Maybe the one thing you should keep in mind is that turbulence can grow magnetic fields. So other bogeymen can grow magnetic fields by something called the turbulent dynamo. And a simple kind of rule of thumb is that you can grow quite quickly when the field is very weak. You can grow exponentially. Eventually, you go linearly and you saturate very roughly when uh, the kinetic energy density is of order the magnetic energy density. So you get equipartition. And the reason is because at that point, magnetic tension sort of doesn't let you bend the field lines as easily as here. So this might be, you know, a rough, you know, hand-waving explanation for why you have equipartition between magnetic fields and turbulence. Now, the magnetic field in the CGM is very uncertain. Um, it was great to have that speed collaboration. So Brian told me about this very interesting result where uh, pe people see coherent magnetic fields of two microgauss in um, magnesium, magnesium two absorbers. And there are also FRB constraints, um, you know, from Faraday rotation, where basically you get something like, you know, a microgauss or a bit less, you know, in halos. And, you know, these are actually substantial numbers. These are comparable to ISM values, but it's, far out in the CGM, right, where we think the gas pressure has dropped by orders of magnitude. So one of my hobby horses is that 
you know, it's conceivable that the CGM could be magnetically dominated, or it, it's a very important component, and we cannot ignore it, right? So, for instance, in these beautiful simulations by Frecker, uh, you know, you can see here that in these biconical outflows, you have extremely low what uh, plasma physicists call beta, right? The ratio of thermal to uh, magnetic energy. So here you're completely magnetically dominated. And so it's an important thing to keep in mind. Now, you know, theory is very, um, uh, it's very unclear at this point. You know, the fire simulations get, uh, they don't, they, they're always thermally dominated in the halo, but it's still early days. <clears throat> So, you know, what are some implications of uh, magnetic fields in the CGM? So they completely change cloud morphology. So this is a recent set of simulations by uh, uh, Michael Jennings and Yuan Li, where, you know, they show, okay, if you have hydro, then you make these clouds that we've all been talking about. But if you have MHD, and even though the magnetic energy density is one ten thousandth of the thermal one, look, you have filaments, the morphology is completely different. Um, another thing is magnetic pressure support, right? Something very near and dear to uh, say Jess's heart. Um, that, that, you know, this, this, this means that you don't have to enforce thermal pressure balance between hot and cold phases. And these are cloud crushing simulations that, that Max has, where you can see in the clouds, uh, the clouds themselves, which condensed out of the cold gas, uh, they're magnetically dominated. Um, uh, another important effect is that, you know, this breakup of cold gas by, uh, uh, by hydro instabilities, for instance, the Kelvin-Helmholtz instability, can be suppressed by magnetic fields. The mag if something is moving through an ambient medium with magnetic fields, you drape around the cloud, and typically you reach magnetic energy densities which are comparable to the ram pressure, right? And then at that point, magnetic tension is strong enough to damp instabilities. So here's an early illustration by Dursey and Frommer. And uh, another point is that magnetic drag um, increases momentum coupling of hot and cold phases. Basically, you have a tow rope between the two phases so that if you try to uh, move one of them, uh, the magnetic fields ha help transmit momentum to the other phase. And so here's an illustration by a paper by Mike McCourt, where um, uh, basically if you, if you go to smaller and smaller distances, that means the two started to co-move after a shorter distance when you pushed on one of them. And so as you increase the magnetic field strength, this distance shortens. So uh, there's a huge amount to talk about. Um, you know, a lot of people in the audience and the panel are experts. So, um, you know, I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to cover all of it. One thing I will say is that, um, you know, we think that we all admit turbulence is very hot, right? And um, also, uh, we all admit that plasma physics and cosmic rays are also very difficult. And so we think, fine, you know, if there are things we don't understand, that's good. But, you know, MHD forces, we think, are passe, you know, like, come on, like, let's be serious here. We know what they are. There are just two of them. I just want to, to, to say that sometimes they behave in ways that at least, at least I find a bit, sorry, for the sun, counterintuitive, and you still have to run the simulation. So here's an example from Storching G. Uh, who is now at Caltech, and I think he's, he's giving a talk on, on Wednesday. But um, back in 2018, he looked at the influence of uh, magnetic fields on thermal instability. And this is something that Prachit talked about. There's this ratio of the cooling time to the free fall time. And um, what Soching found was, was that magnetic fields can have a significant effect. This is a cold fraction of gas as a function of this ratio. And, um, you know, as you increase the magnetic field, even a, a small magnetic field, which is like 3% of the gas pressure, can still have a very big effect. And, you know, at the time, um, you know, Sochang was, was not the, the famous uh, Caltech fellow that he is now. 
And Mike and I were like, oh man, there's a bug in your code. Like, go look at it. Uh, we were, uh, of course he was right. And the reason is that, um, you know, what you care about are perturbed forces, right? So gas pressure is big, but it's, you know, gas great pressure gradients are opposing something else that's really big, which is gravity. The difference of two big numbers is a small number. And that's where a small magnetic field can also change uh, change the system. And so, okay, fine, great. So magnetic fields suppress, you know, in fall, they suppress buoyancy. So it makes sense that, um, you know, the free fall time becomes less important and it's just magnetic tension. But then the other head scratcher was like, look, okay, that's what happens if you have fields that are horizontal. Now let's turn the fields around. The gas should just be able to fall freely like before and we should get the hydro answer. No, you actually get the same density perturbations, even though the morphology of the coal gas is completely different. So again, we were like, oh man, what's this? But then in retrospect, it's also quite obvious, right? So if you look at tracer particles, they are also prevented from falling. And the reason is because it's like you're surrounded, the magnetic field are like confining pipes. If you try to fall, you make a high pressure region and that suppresses your infall. And the stronger the magnetic field, the stronger the confining wall. And so you can work it out, it suppresses infall in exactly the same way. Um, so maybe these are obvious to you, but uh, at least, uh, you know, at the time it was not obvious to us. Um, and, and for instance, here's another head scratcher. Uh, this is a, a, a simulation of thermal instability uh, uh, by Yan Fei Jiang, uh, who was on the panel on Thursday. And um, look at this. Like, what is this? These are these, they're, they're these uh, sort of tadpoles racing away. And um, I don't know, to, at least to me, it's, it's a little bit of a head scratcher. Uh, we think it has something to do with solitons, but um, you know, if any of you have ideas, I'd be interested. <clears throat> okay, so um, you know, I've got, I, I worked out, I got about 15 minutes per component. So let's move on to uh, turbulence. Um, and turbulence is a famously high problem. Um, you know, Werner Heisenberg said that uh, he thought God understood relativity, but not turbulence. Um, so uh, what is it, right? So uh, I think the first week or second week, uh, Joel Brakeman reminded us that we astronomers just think of turbulence as anything that's non-thermal, right? So, so like, you know, all the bulk motions that we see in spectra, we call turbulence. But uh, strictly speaking, you know, turbulence involves an energy cascade, usually from large to small scales, but not always. And uh, it's due to this nonlinear term in the hydro equations, right? This bad thing is responsible for a lot of head scratching, you know, uh, trillions of hours of CPU time, you know, all that stuff. Uh, if we didn't have this, then we would be like in quantum mechanics or a lot of ENM. You know, you have a linear system, you can write down basis functions, use superposition, you know, it's so much better. But no. Um, and the, the sort of standard, uh, uh, you know, the, the, probably the most important thing to know about turbulence is Kolmogorov turbulence, where basically you say there are these things called eddies and they go from large to small scales. There's a cascade from large to small scales. After an eddy turn over time, one of these things goes nonlinear and breaks up into daughter eddies. And this keeps on going. And there's this very nice ditty that sort of summarizes this. There's no dissipation until you reach sort of molecular scales, viscous scales. So in between, there's a constant energy flux from large to small scales, which Kolmogorov wrote down in this way. And that it's very easy to apply. And, um, you know, it's the sort of standard go-to every time you're trying to estimate something. Um, but there is more to life to, to life than Kolmogorov. It's very good to remember, right? Uh, instead of a cascade like this, for instance, if you 
push, if you push on something, especially if you have a shock, right, you can directly transfer power from large scales to small. Something some people sometimes call Berger's turbulence, right? If you have a magnetic field that changes the character of turbulence, there are three independent cascades then. Um, if you have stratified turbulence, then uh, turbulence in a gravitational field, then vertical motions will be suppressed by buoyancy and the turbulence again becomes anisotropic. And you can watch great YouTube videos uh, uh, on this by our fearless leader, Mark Voigt, on the Precipitation channel. Um, there's decaying turbulence. Okay, lots of stuff. Now, why should you care about turbulence? Uh, it can provide pressure support again, but it's pressure support uh, with a time bomb, right? Because turbulence, you always have to drive it because it's always, you know, cascading and decaying. So it's sort of different, say, from magnetic support. It can also diffuse things, and crucially, it diffuses things a lot faster than, say, uh, uh, you know, standard thermal random motions, right? If you relied on uh, thermal motions to diffuse your sugar, you would, you, you know, you're never going to get your sugar hit. Um, so you need, you know, turbulence can diffuse metals, it can diffuse entropy. Um, so it's very important for that. It tangles magnetic fields. It it very much changes their geometry because the magnetic fields just move with the fluid. And by the turbulent dynamo that I mentioned earlier, it also amplifies them. Um, it heats the gas, so there's turbulent dissipation. So at the end of that cascade, uh, all of the energy in the turbulent cascade is eventually converted to random motions in, the, in, the, in thermal particles, right? So it heats the gas. And a lot of these ingredients are put together uh, when you consider the multi-phase structure of, um, of the CGM, right? Consider hot and cold phases. So I will, uh, you know, there's so much to talk about in all this stuff. And, you know, people in the panel have done work on all of this. I'm sure you'll hear about this from them. I I'm going to focus on this aspect. Okay, and just one quick reminder is that um, you know, what we call turbulence, you know, classically turbulence is something that has a, a very high Reynolds number. You know, Reynolds number is a, is a dimensionless measure of viscosity, right? If you have a high Reynolds number, then viscosity is not terribly important. Um, you know, in our simulations, because of limited dynamic range, uh, you, you, you all, you, you, you know, you've, very much affected by numerical viscosity. So for this purposes of a plot, a straight line is good and a curved line is bad. You know, a straight line is very roughly your inertial range where you are in this cascading region that Kolmogorov talked about. And so you're affected by numerical viscosity, you know, 20 to 30 times above the grid scale. You have usually, you have like less than a decade of inertial range in your standard, say 512 cube simulation. So it's just something to keep in mind, you know, like especially if you try to apply scalings in your simulations. Okay, so this is for Drummond. Uh, you know, Drummond said this week we must talk about this. And so uh, being an obedient soldier, uh, here's, uh, here's uh, some thoughts about turbulence and radiative cooling. So um, I want to advertise uh, this paper by Brent Tan, uh, who's a graduate student at UCSB which looks at the parallels between um, uh, turbulence uh, and radiative cooling and turbulent combustion, right? So this is something that even, you know, Zeldovich appreciated a long time ago. You know, uh, here, you know, you, you take fuel and oxidizer and you burn the fuel. Here you mix two phases and you burn hot gas to make coal gas for condensation or vice versa. And there's lots of scaling relations and stuff like that that you can understand in detail through this analogy. Um, you know, I'm not going to have time to talk uh, a lot about this. And, and Drummond uh, talked quite a bit about um, these mixing layers. So uh, I'm just going to highlight uh, two things. One is in regards to something that Frank uh, Van den Bosch raised and which worried us a lot, which is how important is numerical diffusion 
of heat between the phases in affecting your answer. And so we did a lot of resolution studies, studies of, you know, do you have to uh, put in conduction and resolve the field length and all of that. And the short answer is that it's not very, it's almost unimportant. And it's the same reason why uh, the value of numerical, uh, of molecular viscosity is not important when you're mixing in cream in your coffee. You basically stir your cup and you get these thinner and thinner ribbons until molecular diffusion takes place. But if you change the le level of molecular diffusion, it doesn't really change things, right? If you change, uh, say, if you're trying to heat a gas and you stir it, all that matters is the heat input you put in on the outer scale. Eventually, it will cascade down to some scale and dissipate. So, uh, so our short answer is that you really just need to resolve the outer scales of turbulence. The second thing which I thought was, was, was interesting was that, um, you know, when you're cooling in a multi-phase medium, the effective cooling time is not the thermodynamic cooling time, right? But it's also not just the mixing time scale, right? When you mix, the gas can change entropy, right? And so you might expect that to set a time scale. Instead, it's the geometric mean of these two things. And, um, you know, that, that we, you can demonstrate that in the simulations, and, and that's what Brent did. And, um, you know, it's actually very similar to a situation like in conduction, where the field length is actually a geometric mean of the electron elastic mean free path and the cooling length of the electron. Or in radiative transfer, suppose you have a photon bouncing around, it undergoes some uh, elastic scattering and undergoes some absorption. Then, um, you know, if you do like in the first few pages of Rybicki and Lightman, uh, they derive that the effective optical depth is actually the geometric mean of the absorption optical depth and the scattering optical depth. So it's a very similar situation. Okay. And I think the other thing that would be on interest, uh, that's not in that paper, it's something that Brent is working on now, is that, you know, you would like actually to have, uh, to be able to say, put in some of this physics in larger scale simulations where you cannot resolve these mixing layers, right? So if you, if you look at these mixing layers, they're extraordinarily complicated. The mixing layers themselves are multi-phase and there's not a single position where gas at a given temperature comes from. It actually comes from a whole variety of different positions in the mixing layer. But nonetheless, actually Brent has found that you can actually come up with a very simple 1D analytic model that reproduces the results of the simulation quite well. And you can come up with 1D temperature histograms, which is really uh, you know, what say observers care about. If, if you mass weight this, you get column density ratios. If you emission weight this, then you get you know, ver you know, ratios of emission strength of different metal lines. So, um, so we're still working on this, but uh, I think you know, we're excited about this and think that this is promising. Whoops, and now, okay. So there was a lot of discussion about um, you know, fog and clouds last week. Whoops, and um, you know, Todd, uh, Todd Tripp was very nice to us theorists, right? And he said, Oh, observations need to catch up with theory. Uh, you know, I think I think he was he was just being nice, right? Really, you know, theorists are always chasing the observers, and it's no different in this case. Um, you know, my, uh, Mike, when he thought about the fog, was completely motivated by observations, and the observation he was motivated by was uh, this cluster, which well, this high redshift object that that Joe and I, we talked about at UCSB, where he said, look, there's this, there's this uh, big object, which we see both in absorption and emission. <clears throat> From photoionization analysis, we see this dense gas with, uh, with cold bullets, but uh, why is it covering this large area? Okay, it's covering this enormous area when you can work out that given this density and the amount of cold gas you see, the volume filling fraction is tiny, right? So you, what are you gonna do? You're gonna put a very thin shell around the whole halo. And uh, you know, the other problem that 
uh, Joe mentioned was, okay, you've got these highly suprathermal line widths. You've got these low ionization lines, which live at 10 kilometers per second. Uh, and, you know, some of these are optically thin and look, um, you know, thousands of kilometers per second. Uh, anything that has a Mach number of 100 is not going to live. It's, you know, it's just not going to happen. So, um, you know, Mike, you know, the moment after Joe finished his talk, Mike came to my office and he said, well, it's obvious. I'm like, well, maybe it's obvious to you. It's not obvious to me. And he started talking about this form. So it was, you know, it, it I would say that, that theorists, you know, are trying to invent ways to get the fog, but in some systems there is, I don't know how else to explain these two things, right? Um, maybe I, I'll be interested to hear uh, some thoughts on that. So in that case, uh, you, you intersect many cloudlets along a line of sight, and then these two observations make sense. Oops. Okay. So, but you know, there's a lot of interest in sizes. And um, so, you know, I have uh, three young boys. So everything's in terms of a battle. There's T-Rex versus Spinosaurus, you know, Batman versus Superman. So now let me give you, uh, uh, if I'm going to be a fight promoter, Mike versus Max. Okay. The, the, for those of you, know you, of you who know them, they're both very tall, handsome, exceptionally charismatic, uh, you know, guys, you know, your, your classic alpha males. Um, even my wife would tell you I'm somewhat of a beta male. Okay. So, so first, you know, you, whoops, you talk to, whoops, how do I go back? Uh, uh oh, whoops. Okay. So first you talk to Mike and Mike will tell you, okay, look at, look at, look at these simulations. I had a big cloud and now it's in these tiny pieces. What happened? Uh, there was cooling, there was strong thermal pressure gradients and, uh, the cloud lost sonic contact. And so it shattered down to tiny pieces until the, it could eventually reestablish sonic contact. And that happened uh, at a scale CST cool of the coal gas. And I was like, oh man, you're so right, Mike. Um, we've got to write a paper on this. And then you talk to Max, Max will tell you, um, look, there's a minimum size for a cloud to survive, right? You blow something on it, it mixes with a hot gas and it's going to be destroyed in a cloud crushing time unless cooling can overwhelm the mixing. There is a characteristic length scale for this, and it's essentially CST cool mix, right? Uh, when the cooling time of the mixed gas is shorter than the cloud crushing time. Um, and, you know, you're like, Max, you're so right. We have to write a paper on this. Now, there's a problem, right? These two length scales are different. This one is bigger than this one, which means that all of these beautiful little cloudlets will get destroyed, right? And this length scale is bigger than this one. So according to Mike, these things are just going to be destroyed by thermal pressure gradients, which develop. Okay. Um, so what to do? Who's right? And, um, you know, Max has been thinking about this more. And we think now that you know, of course, like, you know, like in all things, you know, both are potentially right. Um, so uh, what's the difference? So instead of doing this, right, where you, uh, in both of those previous works, you considered laminar flow, right? You blow on it with a wind or you do a static setup. Uh, instead, you know, most gas in the CGM lives in a little hurricane, right? There's all kinds of noise and uh, perturbations going on, right? So, uh, you know, this is something that uh, Drummond Fielding and Evan Schneider, you know, always rightly mentioned. So you, you would, you know, you would go to conferences and try to avoid eye contact, but now I can reestablish eye contact. Um, so, so here is Max blowing, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, stirring on a, a cloud, right, in a box you know, with a mixture of solenoidal and compressive driving with tracer particles. And there's many very nice features in this, right? 
So, you know, you can do a clump analysis and the, you know, even after the, the mass has grown by quite a bit, the mass is broadly distributed along a range of scales. The, the big cloud still survives, right? But it, not all the mass is concentrated in it, right? There's still a lot of mass in smaller clouds. And in particular, although the mass is quite evenly, so this is a cumulative plot. Even though the mass is broadly distributed, <clears throat> the area is dominated by the small clouds. So this is, this is area covering fraction over volume covering fraction, normalized in such a way that for a sphere, this is of order one. Now, if you look at a big cloud, the big cloud, you know, sort of stays roughly spherical. But if you look at the entire box, the, the area covering fraction has grown enormously, meaning that, and it will just continue to grow. Meaning that uh, if you pierce a random line of sight through the box, you are much more likely to pierce the fog than you are to pierce the cloud, even though the cloud contains a lot of the mass, right? So, so that's something to keep in mind when you interpret observations. The other thing, you know, when we started this, we thought, oh, what's going to happen is that the small things will coagulate to make a big cloud which can survive. And, you know, I think in the past, some of you heard me mumbling about a peloton. Um, that turns out actually not to be the case. It's true for a laminar flow, but it's not true for a turbulent flow. You need a big cloud in the beginning to survive. If you just have an equivalent mass in small clouds, even though intuitively it should be similar, especially if they're packed closely together, it doesn't work. They all die. And the mass threshold for that big cloud is similar to the standard cloud crushing problem where you blow on a single uh, big cloud with the wind. And then, um, you know, the growth, the total growth of gas, you can kind of understand with analytic models. There's some interesting features when uh, the small clouds dominate the area. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm really running out of time here. Um, one thing uh, that is uh, important to keep in mind is that this thing is very, you know, with turbulence, it's very highly stochastic. You can't just look at, you know, a handful of clouds in your simulation and draw conclusions. You need to ensemble average. So here's an example uh, from Max where there's exactly same initial conditions, turbulence, same, uh, same uh, stirring parameters, just a different random seed. This one survives. And if you keep running the simulation, the mass keeps growing and growing. This one dies. And in the end, there's no more coal gas. There is nothing different about the initial conditions for this. And, you know, um, it's because of the stochastic nature of turbulence. So you really need to have a, either a very big box or to ensemble average, right? So in this sense, if you bring up, you know, it, it's more like thermodynamics or quantum mechanics than classical mechanics. You need to talk about probabilities. And, you know, I think eventually, you know, a Monte Carlo approach to, to understand this would, could be fruitful, right? Where you, um, you have steady accretion, you know, of coal, of hot gas to coal, but also you have breakup, you know, the opposite of mergers. And you can imagine, you know, having a tree where you implement this, some, something like the merger trees in cosmology. Okay. Um, I am super out of time. Uh, so, so let me, uh, I'm going to have to skip the nerd version. It, it, it pains me to do this, but you know, um, you know, the Hollywood version, I guess, of this, uh, this picture is that you have this big mothership, okay, which launches these small droplets, the mist. And these droplets are transient. They, they don't survive. Um, but the big ship, you know, because, you know, it's able to, to, uh, it, it, you know, it, it, the cooling time is shorter than the breakup time, it will keep going and um, it will keep making small droplets. And um, so that's roughly a picture of, of, of how things stand now. So I think there, there are both clouds and mist in, in the CGM and we must consider both of them. Um, they have both have interesting consequences. Okay, so uh, cosmic rays in the last 10 minutes. <clears throat> okay, so why should you care about cosmic rays? So um, they provide non-thermal pressure support. 
um, you know, and here, here's a nice uh, paper by Irina Butsky, who's on the panel, which shows that if you have thermal instability in the halo, then um, you can have cosmic ray pressure supported uh, filaments. And one important thing about cosmic rays is that actually the the pressure they provide is is more or less agnostic uh, to the direction of the magnetic field. So the the cosmic ray pr uh, uh, pressure um, uh, forces are isotropic, right? They just you just have to calculate grad PC. Not you don't have to do any projections along the magnetic field. Um, then they also, you know, the of course the sexiest application, which many of you uh, have written a lot of papers about, is that they drive galactic winds, right? And um, you know they're not subject to radiative losses like thermal gas. Uh, and they can dominate in the halo. I think So Ching Ji will be talking about that on Wednesday. So, um, you know, and they, they can drive a cold wind, which is sort of more in line with what we see in observations. And something uh, which I also very much like, which uh, Josh wrote a paper with, with, um, with Ellen and me, uh, was that um, they can also influence, because they provide pressure support and they provide heating, they can influence thermal interfaces, right? So, um, and you know, we, 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 there's a lot of literature on conduction fronts and um, it's worth also thinking about uh, cosmic ray fronts as well. <clears throat> okay, so, um, you know, Ellen has written two beautiful reviews about this and she's gonna talk on Thursday. So I'm not gonna do too much of uh, cosmic ray physics, just a few very basic things which is that uh, cosmic rays, you know, the light crossing, they are relativistic particles and the light crossing time of a galaxy is short. But nonetheless, we have evidence from spallation and a, a bunch of other things that they live in our galaxy for a long time. And the reason is because they don't just fly straight out, they random walk. And we think the reason why they random walk is that they scatter off magnetic irregularities in uh in the halo and they make these magnetic irregularities themselves something called self-confinement it's also also possible for extrinsic turbulence to do it but there's a variety of complicated reasons why um we think uh the streaming instability should dominate uh for the sort of gev cosmic rays that we care about so okay so they make kinks in the magnetic field and then they scatter off them. And the result is there's a short mean free path. And when you have a short mean free path, you can consider it to be a fluid, right? And you can write down fluid equations. And, um, you know, here's, uh, you know, they, they, there's some nomenclature. We think that they stream. Okay, I'm gonna skip this. Basically, what you care about is they push on the gas. Right, they push on the gas, there's this force, and they also heat the gas, right? And, uh, you know, this is intuitive, right? It's just like thermal pressure. You have a gradient of a thermal pressure here, you have a gradient of cosmic ray pressure. And they heat the gas, this is just a velocity times a force, right? So that's the rate of work done. Okay, there you go. You can hold your own in a cocktail party conversation. So, um, so, uh, okay, so, Yan Fei came up with a very clever way of handling cosmic ray transport um, so that, uh, which has, which is basically how uh, people do it in radiative transfer. And uh, the bottom line is that now, um, you know, everyone, we can all do it in full generality. So, um, and you know, you can apply it to something uh, like shocks, and it still works. You know, you, you reproduce analytic solutions very well, which is something that before is just too demanding. There's sh such short length scales involved, it's almost impossible to do um, with when you have uh, cosmic ray streaming. Okay, so I'm just gonna mention then, right, what, now you have, you have all these rich things that you can go after if you can include both diffuses and streaming transport in your simulations, uh, what is interesting? So I will briefly mention two applications. One is the interaction of cosmic rays with turbulence. 
And the other one is interaction of cosmic rays with sound waves. So, uh, so for the first one, uh, where do cosmic rays come from, right? So the standard picture is a uh, Fermi acceleration. Basically, they scatter off moving paddles, which accelerate them, right? So there's some sort of scattering, right, um, uh, of magnetic irregularities, and that increases their energy, right? Um, and uh, there's two effects. There's first order and second order Fermi acceleration. If you have a random configuration of scatterers, right, then what you rely on, what Fermi argued in his original argument, was that you're gonna end up with slightly more head-on collisions than tail-on collisions. And so you'll have a net a diffusion upward in energy. But it's only second order in the velocity of scatterers uh, compared to the speed of light. So this is a very small number. Uh, you know, then later on, it was, it was discovered, okay, if you have a converging flow, if you have two paddles moving towards one another, then uh, you are first order and it's a lot faster. And this is what happens in shocks. And this is, uh, you know, this is currently what we think actually happens. So all the, you know, all the simulations that you see, they assume that cosmic rays are uh, accelerated in shocks, uh, which are set off by supernova. Um, but, um, you know, I'm gonna argue um, that we might, we should think carefully about this assumption. It is worth revisiting. So this is work uh, by Chad Bustar, who's, who's also on the panel. Uh, he's a, he is a KITP fellow and um, I'm very excited about this. I think, um, you know, it potentially has uh, very interesting implications. So, uh, you know, the second order Fermi acceleration, um, you know, I'm gonna talk about it in this limit where, uh, you know, the scattering is uh, mean free path is very short. So the fluid approximation is good. And uh, this is relevant to what we care about, right? So we can run our simulations in this. And, you know, here what Chad did is he just filled the box with, um, with cosmic rays and he stirred it, you know, with the same stirring algorithm. Um, and, um, you know, watch what happened to the cosmic ray energy density. And look, um, it rises exponentially on an eddy turnover time. There's some hint of a saturation here. And, uh, you know, for aficionados, it actually blows past equipartition with kinetic energy density and appears to approach saturation maybe, we've got to run this longer, when the cosmic ray pressure is comparable to the gas pressure. So, um, so this is turbulence accelerating cosmic rays. And, um, you know, we were very excited about this. Uh, as with all things, it turns out the Russians were there first. Um, you know, some brilliant but very hard to digest analytic paper. Um, you know, he, uh, Tuskin in 1988 derived uh, this curve. This is what Chad simulations look like. And what this shows is the, the this is the cosmic ray diffusion coefficient uh, normalized by stirring parameters. And this is the time scale uh, on which the cosmic ray energy density grows normalized to the eddy turnover time. And basically, um, you know, the fastest growth happens when the cosmic ray diffusion coefficient is of order the turbulent diffusivity, which uh, maybe coincidentally, maybe not, is, is close to a number that people have been pushing, especially those in the FIRE collaboration. Uh, you know, definitely have thoughts about that, but no time to go into it. The other thing is that this acceleration time scale is short. So, uh, so this has very impl interesting implications if, you know, if this holds up. It means that, you know, you have to consider uh, what turbulence does to your cosmic rays. It could change the cosmic ray profile. It changes wind solutions. And, um, you know, cosmic rays can be like a phoenix, right? You can revive them uh, with turbulence. And, uh, you know, we, the reason why we think saturation happens here is because this affects compressibility, right? You know, when you, 
when you uh, when you increase the pressure, the effective Mach number of your flow drops, and then acceleration stops becoming effective. But, but you know this potentially is an interesting way of saying that there is a floor to the cosmic ray pressure, um, and it applies to a number of interesting problems. For instance, uh, in the in the um, in the lat data in the Fermi lat data. Um, there's this problem called the cosmic ray gradient problem, where the, the, the profile of cosmic rays in the Milky Way declines more sl very slowly away from sources, which we think are supernova in the disk, right? So um, I think this is still a, an outstanding problem as far as I know. So this could be an interesting way to solve it. You know, if you have some process in the halo, which basically injects energy into cosmic rays. Um, okay. Now, uh, I'm gonna take uh, three extra minutes, right? It's nine o'clock, but just, uh, you know, Cameron is, uh, is looking askance at me. Okay, very quickly, what happens to cosmic rays and sound waves? Okay, so you have a two fluid thing. Okay, you know, we're not gonna be able to talk about all this. Um, I'm very sorry, Navin. Um, but, you know, really what happens is that, and this was something that these, and you might recognize these people as well, predicted, which is that you will get an unstable sound wave. The cosmic rays will drive energy into the sound waves under the certain conditions. You have a simple harmonic oscillator, which is being driven uh, by, uh, you know, driven, and so it increases in amplitude. And as you might expect, eventually, um, it's going to go nonlinear, and you're going to develop shocks, right? And here is Navin Simmons. So Navin Sung is, uh, is, a, is a grad student at UCSB um, who's done really, really nice work on this. And uh, he found this crazy structure. This is a staircase, right? There's some other KITP workshop now, right? Like Staircase 21. Um, but, um, uh, and, and the other interesting thing is it, it's highly dynamic. And also, there, there's strong fluctuations in gas pressure, right? Um, so uh, what is going on? So we, we think we understand it is due to this thing called the bottleneck effect. Um, you know, and, and Ellen, I think, is going to talk about this on Thursday. So I'm afraid I will have to skip this. There's some cool things, like this distribution of, uh, of, the, of the stair heights, you know, and the, the width of these plateaus, um, they obey a pressure-like distribution. And you can, you can understand all these things, and, uh, you know, it's very pretty. The main thing that you should care about, you know, um, is that, you know, the, the time, you know, in the end, we think the time of average momentum and energy transfer uh, are not different, but the whole process is extremely dynamic. There's very uh, short, uh, time scale, transient density and velocity fluctuations, right? You get order unity density fluctuations. Um, and so, you know, it's something that's interesting, potentially visible with FRBs. And um, the other thing is that, um, you know, given these short, uh, these very rapid uh, pressure fluctuations, assuming a fixed pressure is a, a bad approximation. I mean, look at this gas pressure. Right, um, you do photonization modeling on something like this is not a good idea. Of course, you're going to ask what happens in higher D. It's still there in 2D at least, um, and we're, we're going to keep exploring this. Um, it, it's it's kind of fun. So, all right, uh, Cameron, I'm sorry I went over, but I'm done. <laughs> Thank you very much, Peng. Excellent presentation. Um, uh, there's been some really good discussion uh, in the Slack as well as a few questions in the in the chat. But um, to give everyone a, a break for a couple of minutes and allow everybody to catch up on the discussion that's taken place um, in the Slack, uh, let's reconvene in five minutes at 9.10 um, so people can grab a cup of coffee or use the bathroom or whatever, and we'll start with the panel. Um, if you have questions or comments, go ahead and put them in the Slack. and. Um, and I'll try and get to them as I start to reach out for uh, moderating the discussion that will take place. And uh, panelists, get ready to to um, to join us. Okay, so reconvene in five minutes, nine ten. <laughs>